My name is Dennis Byron. I uh, was a judge, and then eventually I became the president of the tribunal. And, and when did you begin as a judge? In 2004. 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, when I moved into the tribunal building, it was quite well equipped, uh, well furnished, uh, uh, competent staff. The telephones were working, the electricity was on. So the physical environment in which I worked was uh, comfortable. And on a professional level, what, what, what were the challenges that faced you right off the bat? Well, the first thing was becoming familiar with the, um, with the um, special rules of the tribunal. And also, I was immediately assigned to a case which had, in fact, been in progress for some time. So I had to spend a lot of time uh, familiarizing myself with all of the uh, evidential material that had um, been given over a period of some 18 months before, before I joined the tribunal. So I, I put my nose down immediately. And I was, shortly after that, I was also assigned to one or two additional cases. So um, I um, had a lot of um, uh, work to do in familiarizing myself with the uh, information, um, the background information on these trials and the, the legal issues which were, which were uh, going to be raised. Were, were there any issues that you found that were completely unique to this tribunal that you not had to confront before? Well, this is my first experience in international criminal law. I, I had been uh, a domestic judge and a, a lawyer in a domestic environment. So the, the entire process was, was unique. The rules of uh, procedure and evidence, uh, even though they were uh, familiar to some extent, they were also different to some extent because they were an amalgam of the common law and civil law systems. The, the principles of, um, of law um, which we were addressing were also quite novel because as you realize that this was the first time that the concept of genocide was being explored in a judicial environment. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of um, um, study that was required to come up to speed. Is there any moments that really stand out when you look back at the tribunal? <laughs> well, I hadn't even thought about that before, but because most of the work I did was um, was, I thought, important and challenging. Um, the most uh, interesting and challenging of the cases I did was the Karamira case. That was the case of the leaders of the MRND, which had many um, unexpected twists. During that trial, one of the accused um, died during the trial proceedings. And, um, and we also had another situation where we had to um, manage the illness of another accused person for some time. And it was very challenging. That was very challenging because I was, I was concerned with not um, um, having unnecessary delays in the trial process. But at the same time, the rules of fair trial rules which had been accepted at the international tribunals required that the accused persons be present during their, during their proceedings. So there were a number of innovative um, uh, management issues that we had to do to ensure that there was a fairness and also a minimum uh, wastage of time. Was justice delivered for Rwanda, in your opinion? The answer basically is yes. Um, one can define justice in different ways. Uh, I had mentioned that I was particularly interested that the mandate of the tribunal um, related to the um, punishing of those most responsible for the atrocities that occurred during the 100-day period in 1994. Um, um, uh, fostering the restoration of peace in the Great Lakes area and uh, uh, facilitating the reconciliation between the former combatants. And I think that those three objectives were to a large extent uh, achieved 
during the tenure of the, of the tribunal. There is one issue, I, I know that lots of people have um, questioned the fact that um, we, we might be exposed to the issue of vexed justice because the, um, there was only one side of the competence that were, that were prosecuted. But um, uh, that is a matter of concern. Uh, I don't think that the prosecutor had any... Um, well, I've, I've heard the prosecutor's explanations, which indicated that there was no um, uh, intent um, not to prosecute them. The investigations had taken place, and in fact, um, the investigated files have been transferred to Rwanda, where some of those persons uh, from the APF side have in fact been prosecuted and, and, um, and, and tried in the process. But um, we, I think, the tribunal uh, had to face the, um, the imperatives of the completion strategy, which quite early on you know, um, prohibited the issue of additional indictments. So there came a time when we were stuck with the indictments which had already been issued, and those were what we, we tried. Looking back with the, the benefit of hindsight, is, is there anything that you wished could have been done differently? It might be that the decision to um, require us to bring the tribunal to, to an end might have come too early. Because if the completion strategy had um, not been put into effect uh, as early as it had been, the particular issue of victor's justice only may have been addressed if there was a little bit more time in which to um, address that. So that is one issue that I could think of um, that comes off the top. Um, during my um, tour as, as, as um, president, the uh, one of the major issues that we had to deal with was the differing status of permanent and ad litem judges. Now, um, at the time when the ad litem judge was um, conceptualized, I don't think anybody anticipated that they would have stayed on for as long as they did. But eventually, their tour of duty became equivalent to that of the permanent judge, as did their responsibilities. But I think that the issues were eventually addressed by the Security Council. And so the ad litem judge's status was um, elevated with an improvement in the terms and conditions. So they were treated on an equal footing, uh, at least those who stayed on. Uh, so those who would have left earlier would not have had the benefit of that. Those are two small issues. How do you think history is going to remember the ICTR? It depends on who, who is a historian. <laughs> um, when I look back on the ICTR, uh, it was, for me, uh, an important, uh, a very important um, time in, in the history of the world because I saw it as the period during which there was a real chance that the concept of an international rule of law would have become routinely acceptable throughout the world. Um, during those years that we were there, I think people began to believe that there was an end to um, institutional immunity from people who held high political office. And I think that the power of our jurisprudence regarding individual criminal responsibility um, has transformed the whole concept of um, mass perpetrators hiding behind uh, the cover of, of institutional um, Im immunities. So I think that the, the ICTR and our jurisprudence created an expectation that we are moving into a situation where people could expect that mass atrocities uh, the persons responsible for them would be held accountable in a judicial sense. Now, um, and I think that the, the, the problem might be 
those expectations may not um, always be realized. And as the last few years have shown, I felt very inspired when I joined the ICTR because the, it, was, it was really amazing that politicians at the United Nations, when they had political objectives of punishing people, punishing those most responsible, restoring peace, facilitating reconciliation, that they chose a judicial solution. And I believe that the judicial solution was effective. And um, so I would trust that the conflict situations, the uh, mass atrocities which we're witnessing um, throughout the world now, I would hope that the approaches that were developed um, by the tribunal, by this and the other ad hoc tribunals, could assist in helping to make the world a better place. And so I, I think that is one way, that's what I remember, uh, what I think of the ICTR, as a, as a place where, we, uh, where the application of the international rule of law um, helped to make the world a better place. And I could explain that in many different ways because it is not only the abstract conceptual work, but I think that a lot of things that we did actually improved the, the judicial structure in, in Rwanda and contributed, I think our work contributed to the development of the rule of law. At a, at a, that was as a standard there, which was uh, internationally acceptable. Uh, so I think too that a lot of our work that contributed to um, the process of reconciliation, uh, and in fact, the the fact that the death penalty was abolished in Rwanda is to me uh, evidence of that. And I can go on. I don't, I don't think you need all those details, but. <laughs> But there are lots of illustrations where I think that the work that we did helped to make things better.